So Mary, tell us about the, the Council of Elders. So this was interesting because I didn't know we were going to get a farming Council of Elders yes. from a farming community that really relied on the plant food. So these people were not the healthy you know, villager and tribes no. that we visited eating their traditional diet. These were very agricultural based people. Yes. And they had these problems of uh, that we have in America. They, they kind of were hobbled and limping around and missing teeth. So yes. it was a great learning experience though. So maybe you could tell us about this one. It was fascinating. Yeah, because it was like jumping a fast forward into America, right? People had arthritis and like you said, they were missing teeth, so they were grumpy. It was like what you would see in, in a retirement village to be frank, although not so severe. No one was in wheelchairs and no one had dementia or uh, Alzheimer's. So it wasn't as severe as we have now. But it was significant and it was a huge departure from what we had seen in all the other tribes. So this group of people, they are farmers and they grew up mostly on uh, wild meat and then sorghum, millet and plantain. And as the hunting became abolished and they weren't allowed to do that anymore, the meat in their diet really dwindled. And also the dairy, the dairy really went downhill. So now they're mainly consuming maize, really. That's their main food that they have three times a day and they all love it. Unlike the other Ugali. groups. Yes, Ugali. Unlike the other groups, uh, when we asked the Hudson what their favorite food was, every woman was like baboon brain. Ah, I love baboon brain. Uh -huh. Every single woman. There's only meat. one who likes something else. Meat. Yeah, and meat, meat, meat. Yeah. And yeah, you go anywhere and that's typically um, some places they would say butter, but usually it was some kind of meat and they would have the specifics of what that was. Not here. Here we went around to everyone and it was Ugali, Ugali, Ugali. I think there was one person who said something else. Eat human. Les humains à leur meilleur. Chicol manu. C'est toi pour hero. Eat ningen. Mikio, Mikio. Oh my love, mano. Eat old, don't get old. Hello, here we are at the end of the four-part Africa series with my amazing friend, Mary Ruddick. If you haven't listened to the previous three, I'd suggest going back and starting at the beginning. I'd really recommend doing this for this entire podcast series. It's designed as an educational journey through the complex, conflicting world that is nutrition, health, food, the environment, and more. This episode covers the rest of our journey, including the Datoga tribe, the Chaga on the slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro, and the transition of all the native living populations into the villages and then into the city. It's a very clear decline in health as they do so. Make sure to watch this video interview on the Food Lies YouTube channel to see all the photos and videos from our trip. I went back and added them all in and you'd also get to see Mary's smiling face as we talk. There's a bunch of great presentations and videos on the Food Lies YouTube channel as well. You can see the Game Changers debunked film, the Food Lies trailer, and a lot of short highlights from interviews that will go into the film. You'll hear us talk about Cows for Kids in this episode, which is the organization Mary and I started after seeing the lack of animal foods in the diet of many of the tribes we visited especially with the youngest people who need them the most. You can go to cowsforkids.com, cows, the number four, kids.com, and click through to the Indiegogo campaign there. We already are over 60% of our campaign goal through all the generous contributions to the cause. 100% of the money is going to purchase animals for the school children. Mary and I had a great Zoom call with one of our big contributors who put almost his whole COVID relief check in. He said he didn't ask for it, didn't need it, and would rather see it go much further to help communities in need. Check out what we're doing at cowsforkids.com. Also, support the show and my team by checking out what we're doing at nosetail.org. We have boxes of grass-fed and finished beef, buffalo, and lamb that shipped out to the 48 U.S. states. We also have the low omega-6 PUFA pork and chicken with a special diet we feed them. Our other specialty is the ground beef with organs mixed in. It's extra special because it has liver, heart, kidney, and spleen. Most people stop at the liver and heart. We go the extra mile. Get you all those nutrients. Our skin food is back in stock. It almost sold out immediately when we got our new batch. It's that good, I'm telling you. It's a really great deal as well because a little goes a long way. I still have barely dented my jar. It's made from regeneratively grown beef tallow and is all handmade. You can add on our freshly ground seasonings and biltong as well. Biltong is a South African traditional beef snack with no sugar, nitrates, or other wacky stuff. It really saves me on the long flights to and from Africa. I don't think I'd have made it without my nose to tail biltong. That's at nose to tail.org. 
All right. Thanks so much for sharing this show with a friend, giving it a review on your podcast app and being part of the Sapien community. For everything Sapien, including being part of the tribe, go to sapien.org. And now, please enjoy this episode with Mary Reddick. Hello, hello, everyone. We're back with Mary Ruddick with her big smile. I hope you're watching this on YouTube so you can see her face and see all the videos and photos that I'm going to add in. How's it going? It's so good. It's so good. I am just so excited to get to spend time with you. I've missed you since you have flown back home. So any chance I get to have some Brian time, is it's a, it's oh, a good day. Man. <laughs> Yeah, we did our 10 hour car rides and all of that. It's we had quite an experience. And then we went back to our, my, my lockdown LA and <laughs> yes, you all are trying to convince him to come back to Africa. So help me along. <laughs> uh, all right. So this last episode, we're going to cover the Toga, the Chaga. These are two sort of lesser known tribes, I think mm -hmm. uh, that we visited and just what we noticed throughout all of our travels and we're kind of compare contrast talk about city life talk about richard our driver from uganda that's on his weight loss journey doing amazing and any other questions that people have we're going to try to address those so we'll start with the datoga i've never heard of these people but um Maybe you could give us a little intro. Yes. So the Datoga, if you heard the uh, creation myth that we talked about in our last episode, they are the ones that do the farming and have cattle as well. So they have been raising grain for a long time, uh, harvesting grain rather, and that's typically sorghum or millet in that region. Now there's some corn as well, but their traditional grains were sorghum and millet. They do the root vegetables. They eat meat. They eat all of the, uh, really, actually, they eat the same animals as the Maasai. So they do the goat and the and the cattle as well, not so much the chicken, and they do lots of dairy and butter as well. And they had a, a very elderly population. I was impressed with a lot of the older women there, but they're known, you know, internationally. They're not as well known of a community, but they're known as the blacksmiths. They're very skilled in the Datoga tribe, and they can create really wonderful things. You bought some knives, didn't you? I got, yeah, I'll grab some. So I got this um, bracelet. It's a really yes. nice, it's from brass. So they'll get like a yeah. brass water faucet or something. And then they'll use the bellows made out of a cowhide. And they, they stoke the fire and um, they make all kinds of cool stuff. Here's an arrow. This, so this is a Hadza arrow. And the arrowhead they trade, uh, the Hadza trade with the Zatoga for the arrowheads. And I have this one. I also have a... The one that the Hadza have a different arrow for each type of animal, right? So they have a different yes. arrowhead. So some animals, they can just use the, the pointed stick, mm -hmm. right? Some, they use that kind of arrow. Then you have this type of one for the, the baboon because it sticks and all the barbs stick in yeah. so that they can't rip it out. Pull it out, the, yeah. The, the baboons, yeah, would, would tear it out. And uh, yeah, they are very interesting. They showed us, they did the whole method of... Uh, making the starting the bracelet while we were there yes and the women are are real artisans with the beadwork as well so i bought a few of the bracelets they they do beautiful carvings in the brass and uh and yeah they dress gorgeously as well the women mm. were just donned and it was one of the you know we went to them after the hutza and the women in in the Datoga were the most warm towards me, you know, the most social, the most engaging. And they were, I could have just moved right in with them. They were so <laughs> engaging and so welcoming and loving. And the children, again, were very welcoming. They have beautiful homes that are in a, a square shape, unlike some of the other groups we're going to talk about. And they're made with the dung and the mud and the straw as well. And they're made uh, a little bit shorter than we are because of the length of the sticks that they can get. So you have to kind of bend over. But they, they're very similar to the Maasai in lots of ways. And in their home uh, crafting skills, although it's square instead of round, uh, it's very similar in that they do the raised beds with the calf skin and all of that. Yes. And we got mm -hmm. to go inside and we yeah. sat in a circle and they showed us how they do the grinding of the maize. Yes. And you did a lot of grinding, actually. Yes, I, I and did. They a sang lot. a song. It was really cool. They sang the song while they 
while you work. It's it really keeps while you, you work. going. Yeah, it was very upbeat and it was helpful because that's actually pretty hard work to grind. But that stone grinding is very important. You know, a lot of times we think uh, paleo people didn't eat grains, but there were regions around the world, of course, post the, uh, the farming era, the agricultural era, uh, people started eating some grains, but they tended to be low lectin grains like the millet and the sorghum, and they would be stone ground. And stone ground is very important for grains if they're going to be consumed because it releases a lot of the enzymes so that we can then break it down properly and we don't get as inflammatory of a marker from them. So that practice is still done to this day in that village and it's it's very important. Yeah, and so you, there was a flat stone yeah. as a base and then you had a, a sort of more round one and you and it was tilted downwards and you kind of just rub it down and you keep putting more kernels of corn on and you keep grinding it down and then there's a little pile of flour at the end. Yes. Yeah, it was a lovely process. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe you could talk about the nixtamalization that they do in South America. So they yes. didn't do the five-step process here in no. any of the tribes we visited. No, they don't. Although I will say all the tribes are not subsisting primarily on corn. So like the chaga that we're gonna talk about do more of the millet, the sorghum, same with uh, most of the Maasai have not adopted the corn. If they have it, they're having it with milk and that's very village by village. Some of them do, some mm -hmm. of them don't. And uh, and then, yeah, most of them are still doing like the the Iraq, uh, they, they do more of the sorghum millet as well still. So the corn is coming in more now in this generation and you're seeing it more in this, this is in this region of Tanzania and Uganda that we're discussing because in other parts of Africa, like Zimbabwe, corn is widely eaten now. Uh, but in this region, it's still just a part of their diet. But yeah, they're not going through the five-step process. It's not being, it is being stone ground, thank goodness, but it's not being fermented. It's not being sprouted. It's not going, it's not being processed with lye to release the niacin, which is really imperative if you don't want to get uh, deficiency diseases. And so it's still going to cause problems. Right. Yeah, so that's yeah. the kind of high level thing is throughout South America, mm -hmm. they relied way more on this corn, but yes. they realized that they had to do this five step process. So they were mm -hmm. okay. And then a lot of that tradition didn't seem to make it over to Africa. And so now they're relying on it more and more, but it's not a huge part of the diet yet. Mm -hmm. But so it's it's you could see some of the problems it's causing, but it's not a huge problem. Yeah. And you didn't see the health issues with the Datoga. So with the clan that we visited, their teeth were gorgeous. Their skin glowed. They were very social. No one was overweight. There were elders, both female and male. Uh, they seemed very, very healthy. We asked them all the questions too, so we'll go through that. Uh, but they seemed very healthy despite the addition of corn. And I, I still think, like I mentioned with the Hudza episode, I, I think it's because they have all the dairy. I think the dairy is protective, the fat soluble vitamins, in addition to some of the glyconutrients. Pure theory, I could be wildly wrong. <laughs> it's This theory mm -hmm. was concocted on this trip, so don't hold me to it. But uh, that's the main difference. The communities that uh, were adopting the maize and the corn, but that had the dairy seemed to fare better with their health than the ones that didn't. And maybe that's just the the having a higher animal content diet. I'm not sure, but I did see that pattern. Yeah, and just to be extra clear, maybe you could just tell people what happens if you don't with anti-nutrients and what happens if you don't detoxify them? Uh, yeah, so they, they bioaccumulate in the body depending on the, the anti-nutrients. So let's talk about lectins. There's two types of lectins. There's perfectly fine lectins and there are poisonous lectins. And unfortunately, there's not a word to discern them. So if you go and Google lectins right now, you'll see a lot of online battles saying, lectins are fine for you and here's proof. And others will say, no, they're extremely toxic and here's proof. And that's because they're actually talking about two different things. There are lectins that are not harmful for us, like the lectin that's in avocado. And then there are lectins like the lectin found in uh, some breeds of cows in the dairy that we have in the States that are not found in Africa. Uh, and then you also have the lectin that's found in, say, uh, corn 
right? And or beans, or beans. beans too, yeah, right? beans are very yeah. high leptin. Yeah, cashew, uh, peanuts, these kind of things. Uh, most grains have a lot of lectins. Millet and sorghum are the exception. And what happens when a lectin goes into your body? A toxic lectin, and they are toxic. They're classified scientifically as toxins for all mammals, not just us. So it's nothing personal, but they mm -hmm. <laughs> they're sticky proteins, and they stick to our tissue, primarily the stomach lining, and in layman's terms, they pierce a hole. And that allows all sorts of proteins to pass through a, a barrier that should not be exposed. And so it creates inflammation, it deregulates the immune system. They've been tied uh, very, very tightly correlated more and more with each year of scientific study to autoimmunity and triggering autoimmunity. Uh, whether it's the only cause, I, I highly doubt, but it, it seems very correlated. And so they can cause lots of issues. Now in traditional diets, they, they had ways to minimize lectin consumption, and we can certainly handle as humans some toxins in our diet. We can handle some. It's just if we get too many. Uh, traditional diets often would also have specific types of glyconutrients that block lectins as well. So if you were eating, uh, let's say, unfermented corn with okra, which okra is a popular food in this belt of Africa, the sticky protein in, in okra actually blocks the, the lectin. And so it's not as bad. It, it's kind of like a friend coming in and be like, hey, buddy, I got you. It's cool. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so there are ways around these lectins. And that's why traditionally many of the lectin foods have been consumed in history, but they had very specific uh, methods for processing. And those methods are incredibly important. When you take those methods away, you start to get in trouble. And then there's other foods that just weren't traditionally eaten that many people think are a health food now, but have a high lectin content. That was great. Wow. Mm -hmm. And then so gluten, so people know about gluten, that's yeah. the most popular sort of anti-nutrient. And yes. maybe you just touch on that too, because it seems like it's kind of the same process. I'd love problem. to. So gluten is probably the most famous of all the lectins. Many people don't realize it's a lectin, but that is what that protein is. And in traditional mm -hmm. societies, whether you're looking at Greece or France, even today, the bread is fermented for three days. When you do a 72 hour ferment, it brings the gluten, uh, the gluten content from 72 million particles, uh, parts per million down to 12. We can handle 12. Our bodies can handle mm -hmm. that. <laughs> but 72 particles per million, that's a different story. So the, you can see where these traditional uh, processes were very, very important. And when you stop proofing bread for 72 hours, when you start doing rapid uh, bread making, even in 24 hours, it's not enough to reduce the toxins. And so those will start to accumulate. And some of us are more prone than others. Sometimes that's because of what we're eating. In addition, maybe we don't have those things in our diet that are protecting us, whereas maybe our brother does or our friend does because they like those foods, just happen to, it's mm -hmm. coincidence, or we're already weaker. So let's say uh, some of our liver is not working well. You know, there's eight detox channels in the liver. If if phase two and three are down, they're not working well, you're going to be more likely to bioaccumulate some issues. So there's all sorts of reasons why one person is going to be more susceptible than another. But ultimately, having a high toxic load is never a good idea, period. That's great. Mm -hmm. And then I guess we have to talk about nightshades then too, because yeah. on this trip, we noticed Mary and Draco would not eat any <laughs> nightshades. And Jay and I, I was like, oh, I'm going to eat the tomatoes, but uh, <laughs> maybe I'm not going to eat so many tomatoes anymore. But uh, yes. Let's let's go into some nightshades. You know, it's funny. In the first several years of my practice, I used to defend them. I always took them out when someone had arthritis because about 90% of cases, uh, nightshades are a real issue with arthritis. But if we got past the 30 days, the person wasn't feeling any better, I let them have the nightshades back in. What I didn't know at the time was that it's not just that aspect of them that's a problem. They're actually impeding the immune function and scrambling the immune function and the nervous function. And I found out kind of by accident, I went to this conference and learned about this study on lectins where uh, I think it was uh, 93 or 94 people out of 100 had reversed their autoimmunity. And this was in the course of a year, just by removing lectins. And I, I was really blown away by that because I make my autoimmune patients do quite a bit more than that. And I had really only eliminated lectins from my kidney patients and my arthritis patients. Those were the two that was always a hard stop. You can't eat the nightshades. Uh, so it was surprising. And so I came back to my practice with this new knowledge and I realized I need to remove these. And I had some diabetic patients who, di 
folks with diabetes tend to respond very quickly. Two to six weeks, they're regulating their blood sugar mm -hmm. when they're on an appropriate diet and they can get off their insulin and they're doing well. Well, I had a couple patients that their blood sugar was just staying at 120 when it shouldn't. And 120 is low enough for those who don't have diabetes to be off insulin, but it's not where you can go back to eating with your family. So, so mm -hmm. I was really, I'm always in the end game of getting people back to where they can have flexibility with their diet and, and that sort of thing. And so I, with these diabetes patients, the, the small handful that I had that were keeping their blood sugar at 120, I looked through their food journals and they were eating some just very small uh, nightshade foods and lectins maybe once, twice a week. And so I pulled it out and within the, the next week they were down at 84. And so to me, that was a big aha. I, I, these are actually more problematic than I realized. And it's not just my kidney patients and my arthritis patients that need to avoid these. So I started pulling them out of everyone's diet. Now with my health history from my patients, but with my health history, having had very severe kidney disease and autoimmune conditions, I immediately pulled them out of my diet. And it was interesting because you have to be a bit nitty gritty. It's not so much what the food is called. It's how it's produced is more important. And at the time I ate zucchini noodles all the time. I ate tomatoes on a daily basis. I ate a lot of these high lectin foods and especially the nightshades, uh, the bell peppers and these kind of things. And so it, it was funny because I was almost back where I was 15 years ago looking at a grocery store, like, what am I going to buy? <laughs> but, uh, mm -hmm. but I did it. And, uh, and personally, I've never looked back. I thought I would miss the tomato in particular the most. I used to make a lot of pizzas and things like that, grain free, of course, but I would make these pizzas and, uh, and I really loved having the fun food because I was on such a strict medical diet for so many years that it's nice to be able to have some mm -hmm. fun things but I haven't missed it. And I actually have lost the flavor for it. So when I see it on a plate, I'm not, it's like looking at a napkin. I'm not attracted mm -hmm. to it in any way, shape or form. I'm not repelled, but I'm not attracted. And so I've never gone back. And with, with what I've seen with my patients, I can't imagine I'll be recommending them in the future. So I'm not afraid of them and I'll eat them on occasion. I'll definitely do hot sauce. Hot sauce is fermented and I mm. love spicy food, but uh, mm -hmm. same with uh, some powdered peppers. Those are fine too. Uh, that's The lectin content is greatly reduced. So I'm not afraid of it. I don't tell waiters that I don't eat tomatoes or anything like that, but uh, but yes, yeah, neither Draco and I do. For him, it was quite serious. His He had horrific bleeding, weeping, psoriasis. And when he cut out just the nightshades uh, and the lectins that went away. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. when we, it's so funny that people, the calorie bros and people who say that yeah. food doesn't matter, calories are calorie, are just, yeah. it's comical. Yes. It's, it's comical. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, nightshades, I, I think, uh, I haven't been eating much of them at all, but I, I would just get this salsa that was just two ingredients, just, yeah. it was just roasted peppers and tomatoes and I stopped eating it since the trip and yeah, I can, I can live. But then, like you said, on the weekends, have it, you know, yeah. try it. It's, it's just, don't make it a staple of your diet. Exactly. Your body can handle some. And I think that's perfectly fine. So when my clients go into remission, I, I then teach them how to get the appropriate form. So like there's palmy tomato sauce that you can buy that's low lectin. They cook it correctly. And uh, I give them recipes for how to process uh, everything else. So then you can go and you can have the corn that's been done in the proper way and that kind of thing. And even if you can't get the proper, uh, the proper fermented way or cooked way to reduce the lectin. If it's just an occasional food, it's going to be fine. I love it. So we're still on the top. This is still actually very on topic for our, yes. our Africa yeah. visit, because this is what these tribes are doing and different yeah. people. And they weren't eating all the foods that they weren't eating tons of nightshades anyway. And, yeah. and they weren't eating tons of processed foods. They weren't eating. Well, there's so many things. Okay. Yeah. What, what, what <laughs> someone asked about um, allergies. Maybe we could do that. Yes. So the, there were no allergies with the exception of the Hudza. And that's part of why, and maybe we can explain that now. I know a lot of people have wondered uh, why Paul Saladino had a different take on the Hudza than we did. And honestly, he didn't. You know, coming from America and going to see the Hudza, the Hudza are an incredible 
incredible health in comparison to Americans. Like there, you just can't put them in the same stratosphere. Incredible. The difference was that I've been traveling around the world. Brian and I went and saw all these other communities and these other communities were actually even healthier than the Hudson. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that, uh, that anything Paul said was inaccurate. It, everything was true that he said, and definitely something we witnessed as well. We just also saw even healthier groups and on top of that. So I think that's yeah. really important to explain. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wish he came along with us and yes. he, I'm sure he'll go back and he'll yeah. see the Messiah and, you know, see like, wow, there's a whole nother level, you know, yes. because maybe they're getting more, you know, they're getting the blood and the milk and they're getting even more consistent animal nutrition and more calories and they, they're taller and stronger and they live longer and yeah. all that kind of thing. So, yes. uh, yeah, I think he, he, it was just that. Uh, yeah, he didn't get to see it all with us. Yeah, I think it'll be the first of many trips for him. I think he's intrigued to go back. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so then the allergy part. So we did see some. You call them the snotty noses yes. in some uh, in, in the Hudza. But someone asked on Instagram about allergies, and my idea with allergies is that it's not natural. It's completely reversible. And for me, all I did was stop eating. I was never gluten. I never had a problem with gluten. Yeah. I, you know, I ate it all my life. But then I had allergies all my life. I cut out grains and you know most gluten foods, and my allergies went away. Yes. And you know I I thought it was pretty simple that if you have this low grade inflammation that's always like kind of just bringing your immune system down, you'll just have this. Yes. These allergies pop up, and even if I eat a piece of pizza, it'll come back. You know, like once a month, I told you, I was like, oh, I had pizza last night and I feel it. My nose is a little stuffed up. I don't know if I sound different, but I think just the one time a month I'll eat a, a pizza, I, it comes back. Yes. You know, I had allergies. I, growing up, I, I didn't tolerate dairy. I think it was the kind of dairy I was eating. <laughs> I didn't tolerate dairy. Yeah. I, I didn't have an anaphylactic allergy, but I, it would make me really sick when I had it. And mm -hmm. then I got seasonal allergies in high school and when I went to the Bahamas and got so sick for all those years, my allergies became year round. They were really bad allergies and, uh, and they went away when I went on the GAPS diet without even targeting them just within one month of being on it fully gone. It was incredible. And I've seen so many people, their allergies go away as well. Then yeah, just to reinforce what you said, allergies are not in any way, shape, uh, normal. It's a sign of autoimmune conditions in the body. It's a very mild form of autoimmunity, but it's there. And it's a sign that your, your immune system is imbalanced and that you've got inflammation in the body. And when you go to all of these communities, you don't see it. And that's part of why I had such a different take on the, on the Hudsa, because I was shocked to see the allergies in the children, because that's not usually something you see. Right. And that's young at all. At yeah. All. yeah. And, and, but it was only only the three or four year olds yes. or something, right? And then they was, grow just... out of it. So they yeah. just have it until they're three or four and then they're done. So it's not like us who have it throughout our whole life, or maybe it develops in later life and then it gets even worse. It's not like that at all. It's like a very short stint. It seems like it happens for about two years in childhood. Do we have any ideas? Did we, we come up with anything on that? I, well, I mean, I think we didn't see it in the second Hadza community uh, that were eating more mm -hmm. of the traditional diet. So the second, the second community had less of the tourist foods, but they also had less of the maize. They mainly ate the cassava year round instead. And so I, I think it was because they were more true to their traditional diet. Mm, yeah. <laughs> All right. So I think the, the toga, well, we could we could go more into uh, the the general questions that you asked. You did such a good job of always asking this array of questions about their health. So maybe give us a recap on their fertility, yeah. their everyday, do they have pain, the sleeping, the autism, all the stuff. Yes, yeah. So we really asked a lot of questions, trying to get at if any of the children have attention deficit disorder, if any of them have mood conditions, autism, uh, temper tantrums, which. I don't know if we've mentioned, but we didn't hear a single temper tantrum the entire time we nope. were there. Nope. <laughs> One, these kids are chill. Uh, and no. yeah, and no, it was remarkable. The women in the Datoka clan are very fertile. Uh, I would put them on par with the Maasai for fertility. They all have lots of children. 
They had lots of generations alive, uh, maybe not as many as the Batwa, but lots of generations alive. And fertility was very easy. It came without thinking about it. And, uh, and children didn't die at young age and uh, mothers didn't die in childbirth. No one had an issue nursing or latching. No women had period pain. I mean, the the lack of hormonal issues were, was really just astonishing. <laughs> With the Datoka, as you've seen in all of these groups that we've talked to. Yep, mm -hmm. that's great. And then yeah. sleeping problems. Oh yeah, they uh, non-existent. They can't even relate. They don't understand when we're asking them about insomnia. They're like, well, maybe mm. if my body hurts from you know a long hike, then maybe <laughs> if there was an yeah. accident, if I hurt my leg, then maybe I wouldn't. I couldn't sleep. sleep. They're like, yeah, that's all. <laughs> that was so funny. They're like, no, obviously, if you're in pain, we, you can't sleep, but. <laughs> yes. Other than that, they're like, no, what are you talking about? Yeah. Just anything, any pain. Mm -hmm. They're just like, no, all day. We just walk around. We live. That's yeah. it. And no mental disease, no anxiety, no depression, no schizophrenia. None of that existed in this group either. Um, and they, I, it's hard for me to explain how jovial and friendly they are. And maybe... I, I don't know if everyone understands what that means in terms of how someone is mm. producing their feel good chemicals and all of that, but you can look around. I mean, I'm in, I, I was in a mall earlier today in Cape town getting some electronics and I was looking around at the restaurants and everyone's like very slumped over, you know, and like kind mm. of grumpy and not smiling. And the difference is astounding when you have people living in their, their full radiant health, their posture was incredible. Incredible. And uh, yeah, uh, it just it says a lot about someone's physical state, what kind of feel good chemicals they're producing if they come up and they're social with you as opposed to someone uh, who is hidden and shy. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what you found is very consistent. And most experts I talk to on this podcast is how important the, the diet is to the mental health and how yeah. they're, it's all connected. Completely. Yes. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, traditional diets for the win, as always. Uh, mm -hmm. What else with them? Did they have? Do you have anything else that stood out? Because generally, they answered all the same questions in the same way. We have yes. no problems. We don't have daily pain. We don't have this or that. But anything yeah. specific on the Datoga, or I, we move on? I was impressed with seeing both uh, elderly female and males. You saw both both sides for mm -hmm. it, and they seemed very happy about their life situation. They weren't worried about food either. They really prized butter. That was one of their favorite foods. Uh, was butter, and uh, and yeah, I, I mean the big takeaway was just really perfect health, really good health. <laughs> That's so awesome. And I'll throw in one just disclaimer caveat here, like I did in the last yeah. episode or two episodes ago, that we don't think we're experts on all the toga or all the huds or anything. This is our experience. We're trying to recount our experience with the groups we did visit. And this is what we saw and this is yeah. what they reported to us. So <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So this is just our experience and what we've seen with these groups. And like we saw with the Hudsa, the two different groups, there can be varying health in each group. And that's that's to be expected based on what kind of diets they've adopted and what kind of lifestyles they've adopted. But also why this is so important and why I encourage you guys to go and visit, because this is most likely some of the last generations that we'll ever get to see in this kind of health unless something was done. So uh so so it's it's a real gift to get to see people in such good health and uh and it's remarkable that that's good health despite eating some of the foods that i wouldn't normally recommend so that's that was my mm -hmm. takeaway with the detoga that we can do quite well as long as the you know about like 95 percent of our diet is very ancestral you can get away with a small amount which was not my approach historically and probably still won't be for my own self because when we look at the the work of weston a price and there was many other doctors that went and traveled the world around that time as well what they found was even a small inclusion of, of uh, modernized food, of processed food was problematic. So if a bakery was in town and people would buy one thing once a week, that was enough to see the generational decline in health. So that was part of why I was so impressed with the Datoga. I didn't see that with this group. Uh, I saw them to be quite healthy, but again, that doesn't mean that their younger generations will be. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. I love it. Okay, mm -hmm. so now to the chaga. So we yeah. drove across the country and made it up into the the mountains and this beautiful, beautiful scene. This is the Hobbit land. It was chaga land. It was so cool. Amadeus was an amazing host. Actually, I just noticed we follow each other on Instagram now. He's an amazing oh, artist too. Yeah. He's a he's like a hip hop artist. Uh, we could maybe link to his uh, music video. We he made a definitely. cool music video. Yeah, we should definitely. And Drago actually helped him produce a song. His buddy, uh, I don't remember his buddy's name, but he's another a rapper. And mm -hmm. they made a song one night and uh, Draco made a whole production out of it. So yeah, I think it's very cool spot. Hakuna matata Masai na mchaga ni story Hakuna matata Nite mchaga Masai uh, very amazing spot I'm so glad we went up there We just had one night there and one morning But just magical lands I'll include some of the video You, you check in by hiking Across a waterfall into, It was so cool <laughs> Yeah, it's it's basically the Shire. It you feel like you're a hobbit and you're going into a <laughs> hobbit celebration when you go into this place. They live in such a different way than any of the other communities did. You know, they're in the rainforest, but they're not hunter-gatherers and they haven't been historically. So they've been uh, on Kilimanjaro, not in the base, not in the valley, but on Kilimanjaro for the last 400 years at least. And most likely have come from Egypt. That's the way that their fable goes. And they live in these round huts called Chaga huts, or traditionally they did. There's four stages of houses based on the year. And uh, over the last hundred years, they've gone through four different stages. So now a lot of the houses are made with like wood or dung as well. So very different looking houses now than they used to have, but they still have some of the old ones on the property, but it's just gorgeous. There are these lush bananas growing and taro plants, which is one of my favorite plants. I think the Eddie or taro, it's called a different thing everywhere, but it's a really beautiful plant and very lush. And then there's waterfalls everywhere. And yeah, the car, it takes a few hours to get there from Arusha. And then the car has to kind of off-road this crazy way. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. it parks. And then from there, you get your bags and you hike into the village. And it's about a 10 minute hike, maybe a little more. And you go across a waterfall and through a forest. And then you hike up and mm -hmm. then you get to the old Chaga village. And uh, and it's just, it's just beautiful and so welcoming and everyone the chaga are my people like if i can go live somewhere it's to them they are the funnest group and so nice and loving and they're singing all the time we got to have the banana beer oh my gosh we made it for the banana beer on sunday every sunday they have the banana beer bar open and there's the old men gather around and they have these giant cups these like 64 ounce cups or and uh it's brewed. Maybe you could just tell us how it's brewed. Yes. Yeah, I'd love to because, you know, a lot of people ask about ferments in these traditional societies, and this is the ferment for the chaga. So they'll make yogurt as well, but primarily and sour milk, but primarily their main ferment is once a week on Sundays. It takes seven days to make it, and they drink it all at once, and then they wait seven days again while it's fermenting. And so what they do is they ferment the millet for three days. So they get millet is a traditional grain of the chaga, same with the sorghum. 
So they'll ferment the millet for three days. And then when that's done, they'll ferment uh, starchy bananas. Think like green plantains, really, is basically what it is, for another three days. And then they'll combine the two and they'll add quinine, which quinine is uh, what's in tonic water. And it is a, a very powerful anti-malarial and anti-parasitic. And it comes from the fever tree bark, which grows wild in that region of Kilimanjaro. And so they scrape the bark and they dry it out and they powder it. And then they add it to their fermented drink and then that needs one more day with all three of those ingredients together and then they can have their celebration so every sunday just like the shire the entire village comes in the children the women the men and they all have this banana beer and the way that the the cups are shaped it's a gourd that's been dried with a long stick you can't put that down it'll tip over so mm -hmm. you share it so everyone shares from the same big cup or like two or three people will share from a big cup and it's very lovely and communal <laughs> It's so cool. And I, yeah, I got to carry the gourd around. We went on a hike and I was just carrying it around and uh, sharing it. I'm also uh, going to include video of the the big cups. So now they have some modern plastic cups as well. But the traditional is that kind of calabash thing. But they also have their big modern plastic ones as well. And uh, we, we have some drone footage of us drinking and singing with all the old the old men it was so fun it was oh, the man. best and usually it's really old men at that table so draco and i had been there earlier because uh we were trying to fit in as much as possible so we had gone before brian and jay arrived and then while we were there, we had so much fun that we really regretted Brian and Jay not getting to experience it. So we actually like forced it into the end of the trip yeah. before we went to Uganda to get so that you guys could see the chaga because I felt like this this little slice of heaven needs to be experienced by everyone. And uh, and the only unfortunate thing was that it was raining the night we brought you guys, and so many of the old men had gone home. So there was still old men there, and uh, but the old ladies had gone home. Um, and so, so it was really the the more like forty year olds and fifty year olds that were still in it and still mm. enjoying themselves. Uh, but yeah, no, it was a blast, and they have a full bar and all those mm -hmm. kind of things where all of these things are fermented. And they do have the plastic cups. They use both the big plastic jugs, but they're still just as big. You have to share them. It's too much to drink. Oh yeah, yeah, and and the calabash as well. It's awesome. And Mary brought them around. It was, they were so stoked. They're like, oh, you know, he told them Mary's going to buy you one. And they're like, oh, okay, we're going to all share one. And they each got their own. And they're like, no way. They were going bananas. It was the going best bananas. night. It was the best night. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then we walked around with Amadeus and he showed us around. I thought the streams are so cool. It's kind of like aqueducts, right? Yes. So they have the one main water source and it they split it up and each person gets their own little stream to feed their plants and their houses. Yes, so imagine this scene, if you will. Tiny little narrow hiking paths on big, big foothills and the base of Kilimanjaro, right? Base to mid Kilimanjaro tons of lush greenery and then every so often a house and the house will have an outcropping for the animals so they all the chaga have always raised animals and they raise it in the house we'll go into that because it's a very different way of raising mm -hmm. animals um so they'll have these little huts and then the water comes from the glacial stream so they have the freshest water of anywhere we went to and just an abundance of water to each and every single house. And so you're walking to each house and as you do so, you'll see people working in the garden or children running up to say hello. It's about as idealistic as one can get. <laughs> yeah. It's a fair, it's from a fairy it's tale. A fairy the tale. kids remembered, they remembered Mary and they were so cute and they came running up and saying hi to her. Oh, it's the best. I love, I love those children. If they didn't have the most perfect childhood, I won't, I would want to take them all home. Like they're really good kids. <laughs> <laughs> so they, what is their diet like? So they yeah. have a very, sort of plant base in a way i mean they all they all keep animals in their houses which is really cool but yes. since it's such a lush rainforest they mm -hmm. just rely well not rely but enjoy i guess a lot of plant foods they eat it all i wouldn't call it plant-based and i wouldn't call it animal based i i would say it's pretty even so the chaga basically mm. eat what i give people as the maintenance diet so once you're healthy and you're ready to maintain your condition you've been healthy for a long time this is kind of the diet i give people it's got the traditional basis so you've got the 
milk from both the A2 cows and the goats and the sheep. You've got eggs, you've got fish. They eat a lot of fish. Lots of the communities we went to don't, even when there's fish around. Um, but the chaga do. And they eat quite a bit of fish. And then they also eat the plants that grow in the year. Now they eat them when they're in season. So like corn mm -hmm. comes in season and they eat it for a short period. Uh, but then sorghum is in a different season, millet's in a different. And also they have sister villages that grow them. And, and mm -hmm. because of where they are, those foods will be grown at different times of year, actually, even in, in just a short distance of mm -hmm. five miles. It's fascinating. But they eat more than the grains. The grains are a small part of their diet. It's really more the root uh, vegetables, the starches, and the starchy bananas, which I, I would mm. call plantains. So they have a very famous soup called the banana soup. And this is a, a well-known chaga tradition where they cook up the starchy bananas with uh, a broth. It'll either be a chicken or a fish broth. We had it with the goat. So we had a goat broth with mm. it and some goat meat. And then they'll put other vegetables in there as well. They eat a lot of taro. In fact, uh, they were growing five different different species of taro and they use them for different things and they do cassava as well so lots of those and then they love avocado they do quite a bit of avocado they drink coffee they've grown coffee really since coffee has been on the continent and so it's a great place to go if you like coffee because you wake up to a fresh cup every morning and they're liberal with it they're more american with it they give you a lot mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, and then they do the fresh fruit so while we were there they had pineapple apples in season and mangoes. And so that's what they served us that. And then of course, bananas, the starchy bananas, the soups, and they really give you usually a feast. Many of the nights I was there before you guys joined, it was like fish plus soup plus this and that. Mm. But I think I messed things up when we were coming because I was so excited for you guys to try the banana soup. That's kind of all they served you. Oh, and, mm. and the chapati, which is, so they also do a flatbread which you see throughout Tanzania, but what's different is what it's made with. So in uh, in the chaga tradition, they make it with the cassava flour or the tapio tapioca flour. So it's cassava plus fats, which their traditional fat would have been butter and uh, and salt and water, and that's it. And the chaga do eat salt. They love salt, unlike some of the other groups that we went to. Yeah, we should talk about uh, all the differences in the groups from the high level in a second. And salt might be the first one because that was yeah. so interesting. But to finish off the Chaga experience, man, Amadeus was so cool, yeah. so generous. I noticed yeah. we, we gave him all these gifts. It was the end of our trip. We gave him macadamia nuts from Hawaii that Jay brought. And I had some nose to tail seasonings and some yeah. um, biltong and all this stuff. And he just immediately gave it away yes. to his friends and his workers. Yeah. I could not love Amadeus more. And I feel like Amadeus is just a perfect example of, uh, of the Chaga community. They are so loving, so giving, so generous with each other, with outsiders. And you, you literally feel like a hobbit when you're there. They're not short, by the way. They're tall and fit. Uh -huh, and the yeah. neat thing about the Chaga is that they're very modernized in that, like on the weekends, these guys that we were staying with, Amadeus is an incredible musician. They have records, they have albums. And so they go into the city and they produce their music and then they come back and they they take care of the the land and they're very close to their families it's in such a loving beautiful way and the children will just swarm you with love when they've never even met you before. And, and this isn't a place where there's a lot of tourists. So it's it's not like this is a thing. You know, they're not like coming yeah, up to yeah. swarm you so that you give them treats. There was none of that. It was no. it was genuine just um friendliness and kindness and love. And uh yeah, those kids I I really want to help because their school lunches are not great, but their their food at home is incredible. And many people, if you just see our photos from the trip or maybe even our videos, when you look at the Chaga village, it'll look like the people may be poor because you'll see the children in tattered clothing for school things. Uh, so their mm -hmm. school uniforms might be tattered, right? But to be honest, of all the places I've ever visited, I think it's the most wealthy uh, because they have mm -hmm. all the food they could want, all the water they could want. Uh, they are endlessly happy. You know, you go places and they're singing songs and uh, they all take care of each other. If someone loses, say, a parent, uh, they're kind of adopted by the whole village. It's, uh, it, 
I'm probably yeah. on cloud nine. I'll stop. But yeah. it's, no, it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Amadeus would, he was, yeah. we were pointing out kids that he's like, he buys their uniforms yes. for them. And then one of the problems why they're a bit tattered is because they yeah. don't have much use for money. Yeah. They don't and use so the money. Only, <laughs> yeah. So the only money, so the only reason they need money is to buy these uniforms. And yeah. so they're very expensive compared to, you know, what they need to live. So yeah, yeah maybe they're not the best uniforms because they just, it's not part of their life and this that's the right part. so yeah so they don't use money and and like many of these places they're communally based so anything brought into the village is shared with everyone and so uh this idea of having to have money for the kids to go to school for uniforms this is like well where do we get it from <laughs> what do we do kind of thing and so yeah. that's why and also uh, people will really wear out clothing until it's gone it's not seen as a, a bad thing to do that it's it's just what's done so it's practical yeah. it's, pra it's really quite practical yes and yeah so that's why you'll see tattered clothing it's not because these are destitute children they're they're far happier than any child I see in the states it's it's just that it's not part of their culture and part of the reason they wear the uniforms throughout Tanzania, why that's a, a kind of like a law that's laid down is so that the tribes will get along better so that people can't be so there there is a reason for the uniforms uh, uh but it does it does cause a lot of problems well mm -hmm. yeah it's because each tribe has their traditional garb and if they all showed up and then there could be little tribal yes. warfare that's <laughs> right so <laughs> that's right but if they're all wearing the same uniform then everyone just gets along and no one cares yes <laughs> that's what it, we were told, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So I guess, okay, we'll talk about the huts. We went into the traditional hut, the first generation of the style of hut, and it was very cool. It was like a very, like a teepee shape, like very tall, circular, and inside was very cramped little living quarters, but they, they did well. I, all these people, it's so funny, uh, not funny, but it's so interesting how happy they are with these supposedly sparse conditions you know very that cozy. we would not like it's very yeah. cozy yeah because in this in this hut it would be smaller than a bedroom a, a, like an american bedroom it would be smaller than that much smaller actually it's oh yeah like a guest room smaller than a guest room and in that space you would in the traditional hut you would have your cow sometimes two cows you would also have your goats and your chickens and then in the middle you would have your fire and then on the other side uh the opposite to the animals you would have your bed and the whole family sleeps there and the chaga have big families they're monogamous they get married young and they stay married and their children stay with them until they're 16 and then their children get married and uh and then they get their own huts and that kind of thing but now the houses are more square typically but they still have that same arrangement where the bed is kind of on sticks and then you put the uh the cow hide down to lay on and everyone just snuggles together it's just a big cuddle puddle it's it's pretty interesting <laughs> and it's interesting the cows and the goats are in the hut yes, with them completely different than the maasai right they don't take them out to graze in fact amadeus our host uh is chaga but his grandfather was half maasai and half chaga and so he actually has a field where he takes his cattle in the tradition of his grandfather but no one else in the village does that the cattle stay in the house or in their yeah in their bins and they just like hand feed them yeah. Grasses and whatever else. Yeah. And that's something important to highlight, Brian. None of these places that we went to, none of the animals are getting feed. They're and that was air quotes for the for you for mm -hmm. you just listening. They're getting things from the land. So the chaga were chopping up some of the uh, the plants and things like that and bringing it to the cattle to eat, the goats to eat, that kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great stuff. Mm -hmm. So the salt thing. So let's go in. Yeah. So the chaga embrace mm -hmm. salt yes and the maasai had no time for salt no zero interest i think part of it is that the maasai one they don't need it in their diet because of what they're eating but also they're so proud right a lot of their traditions are about building character and not needing things and so i think their their staunch take on like no we don't eat salt is that we, we, we got the blood. We're drinking blood. Yes. We're drinking liquid salt. <laughs> yes. No. Yeah. Whereas the Chaga, they love the salt. Uh, people in Uganda love salt. The Batwa were crazy about it. And there's a lot of areas to cultivate or to, to harvest salt in Uganda. So it's easier to get there, which may be part of it as well. 
and then the hods that are in between where they don't need yeah. it at all. They <laughs> they completely fine. They just cook away and you know it's completely mm -hmm. unseasoned. But then if you give it to them, they're like, yeah, sure. why not? Yeah. <laughs> we'll use it. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And and then the the water drinking. Someone just posted a comment on one of our YouTube videos of these talks, and they said that they've found the same thing that these ancient mm -hmm. cultures don't drink water during the day. At least they yeah. say they drink water in the morning and they drink water when they get home, yeah. and they're good. Yes. Yeah, and I think we probably weren't that different too long ago. If you go to any antique stores, all of the glasses are tiny, right? And you have to think nobody was going to the well all the time. <laughs> but I think we require, honestly, a lot more water. We have a lot of toxins to deal with, and we have a high-stress lifestyle. And when you're stressed, it imbalances your electrolytes. Typically, your vasopressin hormone gets destabilized. And when that happens, you don't regulate all your electrolytes. You don't take all the water into the cell. Plus, we're eating a lot more carbohydrates in our culture as well. And when you eat a lot of carbohydrates, the body takes it. Well, it requires four times as much water to process a carbohydrate than it does a protein or a fat. So I think there's a lot of reasons why we're so thirsty, but I think most of it's stress. You know, all these places we went to, everybody's so relaxed and happy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of these other high level things that we can report on from all the different communities. Let's talk mm. about lifespan. I'll hand this one to you. <laughs> mm. Lifespan was interesting. Yeah, because we did see. So uh, Clemens said his dad made it to 110. Then we mm -hmm. talked about the 120 year old Batwa woman and her 91 year old daughter and the other yes. daughter maybe was 100. And yeah, I just got some pushback. I mean, I, people post online. They're like, hey, this is this is wrong. Like they live mm -hmm. to 45. And that's just so not true. Is it from? Yeah, yeah. So all I could find was a blog, a non-scientific blog of someone stating that as fact, who was not a scientist. <laughs> And yeah, and anyone who had spent any time in Tanzania could say that that or Kenya that that's not true for the Maasai. They're wildly healthy. They don't even have uh, infant mortality issues. So it's not an issue. The, the most common issue where you see the wrong number like that is that they're exactly and they're averaging in the child deaths with with the elderly. And so that brings the number down and it makes it look like people die young when it's really that if you make it past childhood, then you live to 70, 75, 80, like, like everyone else. But no, that's, that's not the case. Uh, everyone you talk to, they die from old age. And it's only once modernized foods come in that then they start to get illness when they're old. Uh, I mean, really old. There were some of the communities that we went to that have childhood deaths. That was mainly the Hudsa, and that was from cold, uh, from not having proper protection from the elements. That's that's what the children would die from. But even with the Council of Elders, which we haven't even discussed, we got all of these elders together, and it was really interesting because there were quite a few elderly there. But to be honest, they didn't look very healthy. They well, they didn't. They looked like normal people of that age, to be honest. You could see arthritis. Yeah, you could see t uh, tooth loss and uh, fatigue and some grumpiness and all those things that we tend to see if we go to a retirement village, right? And uh, although no wheelchairs, it wasn't that bad. Uh -huh. So Mary, tell us about the, the Council of Elders. So this was interesting because I didn't know we were going to get a farming Council of Elders yes. from a farming community that really relied on the plant food. So these people were not the healthy, you know, villager and tribes no. that we visited eating their traditional diet. These were very agricultural based people. Yes. And they had these problems of uh, that we have in America. They, they kind of were hobbled and limping around and missing teeth. So yes. it was a great learning experience, though. So maybe you could tell us about this one. It was fascinating, yeah, because it was like jumping fast forward into America, right? People had arthritis, and like you said, they were missing teeth, so they were grumpy. It was like what you would see in, in a retirement village, to be frank, although not so severe. No one was in wheelchairs, and no one had dementia or uh, Alzheimer's, so it wasn't as severe as we have now. 
but it was significant and it was a huge departure from what we had seen in all the other tribes. So this group of people, they are farmers and they grew up mostly on uh, wild meat and then sorghum, millet and plantain. And as the hunting became abolished and they weren't allowed to do that anymore, the meat in their diet really dwindled. And also the dairy, the dairy really went downhill. So now they're mainly consuming maize, really. That's their main food that they have three times a day and they all love it. Unlike the other Ugali. groups. Yes, Ugali. Unlike the other groups, uh, when we asked the Hudson what their favorite food was, every woman was like baboon brain. Ah, I love baboon brain. Mm -hmm. Every single woman. There's only meat. one who likes something else. Meat. Yeah, and meat, meat, meat. Yeah. And yeah, you go anywhere and that's typically um, some places they would say butter, but usually it was some kind of meat and they would have the specifics of what that was not here. Here we went around to everyone and it was Ugali, Ugali, Ugali. I think there was one person who said something else, but, uh, but yes. Yeah, so, they're proud. It was yeah. like, they're very proud of their mm -hmm. Ugali. Like, I, I don't want to jump the gun or maybe you're mm -hmm. about to say this, but it seems like they had a different notion of what a favorite food even meant. It was yeah. like, this is a food that we rely on and it yeah. gives us sustenance and we like it because we are, we need to survive. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they just loved it. And uh, and they talked about it a lot. <laughs> but they also talked about how their health has changed from their parents' generation to theirs, and also from theirs to their children's, their grandchildren's. And they've also talked about the change in their diet, but it didn't seem like the connections were being made. So they're now eating a lot of vegetable oil. They're eating the uh, maize and vegetable oil primarily. Those, those are their main foods with some beans. Whereas they had been eating a lot of meat in childhood when they they could hunt and a lot of dairy as well. But the animals have become too expensive now in that region. And so they're not eating very many of them. Yeah. And it was kind of apparent. It was yeah. just this classic thing that we keep talking about of just going downhill, just the more you move Rapidly. away from the traditional diet. Yes. Yeah. And when we asked them how their parents passed away, every single person was old age. It wasn't infection. It wasn't heart attack. It wasn't anything else. It was, uh, you know, they got very old and then they fell asleep. And we asked them if people were dying younger and they said, yes, we asked them what people were dying of and they could easily say what it was. You know, this was an infection. This person was coughing and then they coughed blood and then they died. Um, I'm giving that as an example, but they, they could very easily mm. give explanations of what people were dying of. I think so often people assume that uh, proper diagnosis wasn't made before. And so, uh, so we are romanticizing the past, but that's honestly not true. You can tell if someone is uh, falling, dying in their sleep versus dying of an infection. They get a fever, they get a cough. There, there's clear signs of infection or other condition. Um, we asked them if their parents had uh, any of the issues with walking and these kind of things and, and none of the issues there. Now, still in this community, you don't see illness until they're older. So they're not having people with autoimmunity and issues in the 20s, 30s, 40s, right? It's setting in an older age, but much younger than the Chaga. It's not waiting until the 90s. It's, it's more like the 50s is what I was seeing. I don't know if you agree. I think it was around the 50s. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yes. The, these people were fine until their 70s and 80s, it seemed yeah. like. And it was weird, the cognitive dissonance, though. So they did report that they their diets were different. They used to eat more meat. And now they eat this Ugali and this and that. And they did agree that people are dying younger and having more conditions, but they couldn't make the connection. Yes. Right? They didn't have they didn't. We kind of try to ask them like, oh, so what do you think it is or what's going on mm -hmm. with the new foods? And they're just like, I like Ugali. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's really true. And even they had a clear picture of what was happening with infection too, because we asked them if they had ever seen their parents sick and they hadn't. And we asked them if they ever got sick. And then we asked them if their kids got sick and if their grandkids. And it was very clear, like, nope, they don't get sick. We don't get sick. Ah, they get sick every once in a while. The kids get sick all the time. You know, they really yeah. get the infection. So um, so you could also see it. But yeah, the connections weren't made. It was it was fascinating. Well, yeah. it's rough. We can't we can't solve all the problems here. Um, anything else? Anything else on a high level? Um, I'll, I'll tell you my closing thoughts is I was surprised that 
how much how much obesity especially in the uganda the women over 45 mm -hmm. could exist without processed like tons of yeah. with junk food you know yeah. i mean, i was just surprised that just how bad it could be without abject garbage food you know like mcdonald's and just sodas yes all they had was vegetable oil and maize those were the only additions to their diet and a higher quantity than the animal products. That was it. And they were very obese, very, like exceptionally yeah. obese. This is not a light yeah. obesity <laughs> that we are talking yeah. about here. So yeah, that, that was mine too. And then I would say my biggest takeaway from the trip was um, how, how incredibly far away we've gotten from our innate natural state of health. And that even for those of us in, in America that think of ourselves as healthy, we're, we're not, we're nowhere near mm -hmm. what the human body can be and how natural and normal it is to be healthy and how abnormal what we're dealing with is. Um, it, it's, it's honestly, of all the travels I've done in all these years, there's never been such a stark contrast coming back to work as there was on this trip. And uh, the beautiful thing is that it shows us what's possible and that we can attain that and that we can help our children as well to not go through these things. But, uh, but it is, it's pretty eye opening. That's the yeah. best way to go out on because it, it's alarming. Yeah, we just think it's normal. I, I did this kind of – my rant in the last uh, Hadza episode is like this is not normal. Humans are not meant to live how we live in America. We've normalized it. It's, it's, insane, to, it's insane to believe this. And, and I, yeah, I think this is our one big message to people is, I mean, go there if you can, but just know that there's a different way to live that humans can thrive and then you die in your sleep and this is the natural way that it's always happened yes and, yes yeah. and that aches and pains aren't normal being tired isn't normal having allergies having autoimmunity uh getting sick having cancer none of these things are normal having anxiety and depression are very abnormal all of this is outside of the realm of normal human experience and uh and I think the reason why we think so much medicine is needed is because the, the medicine is advanced with our level of illness. The more ill we become, the more we need emergency medicine. But realistically, we can get rid of that need if we just take care of our health. 100%. Let's do it, everyone. It's very simple. These people are just living on natural food. So yes. one last thing is just to put a cap on my fact that they had no processed foods and junk foods. It, these people were just eating natural foods and they're all pretty much doing well. And then just, you know, when they started coming in, these older people we mentioned were starting to have some problems, but otherwise they were living on natural foods and they lived well. And that's, it's as simple as that. Just get, yes. get some animal foods in there, eat whole foods and you're going to do well. I think so. the other takeaway as well is that each of these communities we visited ate different diets, but they all ate ancestrally, yeah. they all ate locally, and they all ate in season. And uh, and it shows you that you can be healthy on lots of different things, but that you can lose your health very easily if you're not doing something ancestral. 100%. And the last thing we should say is the Cows for Kids. Yes. Cowsforkids.org, cows with the number four. Um, we talked about last episode, but since we're talking about all this stuff, we want to get people behind it. We're putting in our money to yeah. buy these communities, some animals so they can eat their traditional diet still. And not all of them, uh, have enough money to afford enough animals, right? So they, yes. they want more. This is a common sentiment is we, yes, we, we like to eat our bananas and all this, but we want more meat. We want more milk. We want more butter. Yes, and this is something we can do right now. You guys can help us. We can help an area stop illness, right? Instead of just reversing it, like we're always doing, we can actually halt the process and keep that example, keep that wisdom alive and hopefully continue to help more people through, through their experience of perfect health. And I want to get a control group going. Yeah. This is what we have to line up is if we get these cows, for example, for this, the Maasai mm -hmm. school that we visited, 
And then if we could find another Maasai school that does not get the cow and has to eat just a sugar flour oil, yes. little porridge, and then make some, um, yeah, maybe wait a year and then see if we can see some differences. Yes. And that's what we're doing. So we're starting with the Chaga village, the school, because the kids are fed great at home. It's the school that's the issue. And once you start anywhere, you see the downfall in the health. So we're going to help the school there and then the Maasai school and then the Batwa, of course, who are in real dire need. I would say of animal products. Yeah. Yes. That whole village yeah. just needs it. Yeah. I mean, there's school too. They're talking about the, yes. the teachers had to, did they volunteer? It, yes. it was crazy. Both in the Maasai village yeah. and in Uganda with the Batwa, the teachers were volunteering. They weren't being paid. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. Cows4kids.org. Mm -hmm. And we'll have an Indiegogo link there. And um, yeah, you can contribute at any level. We're going to be contributing our money as well. And um, yeah, we're going to be giving updates on all of these people. Oh my God, we didn't give the Richard update. We'll yes! do. So Richard was our driver in Uganda. He was a, he was a big fella, you know, <laughs> he, he has some weight to lose and very excited to um, start his weight loss journey doing very well. He said his clothes are fitting him again. He's losing tons of weight. He said his friends aren't going to recognize him soon. <laughs> and it was just so funny because he saw us eating, uh, basically yeah just animal-based diet and not eating breakfast and he couldn't figure it out and <laughs> he because he was like the type of guy like i can't go you know two hours without eating yeah. and we told him about running on fat we told him what, how meat is healthy and he told us that his sister's a doctor and his sister is very obese by the way and trying to get him to eat a plant-based diet she's trying to eat a plant-based diet and she's telling him that meat is bad for his health and you know, we come in here telling him the exact opposite and he gets really excited, starts right away on the trip, has continued to do it in the last week and a half and is doing amazing. He says, I'm not yes. hungry anymore. Uh, everything's better. Maybe you could tell yes. you've been texting with him more than I. What, well, what is he been reporting? Have, but he's just been over the moon. He's texting pictures of his food already before and after photos. And it's been like two weeks. <laughs> He is literally over the moon. He can't get over that he's not hungry and that he's dropping all this weight because he's been trying to lose weight for a long time. His br he, so I think what there's like five or six of them in the family, three of them moved out of the village and they all became obese when they moved to the cities. His other siblings in the village are not obese at all. They're, they're fine. But uh, the three oh. of them that moved out, yeah, gained a ton of weight. And all of them were told the same thing. They were told to eat a ton of fruit and stop eating the meat. And his brother who took that advice continued to gain while doing that. And then his sister hasn't been successful. He hasn't been successful. So here he He's been doing our plan. He's started intermittent fasting and he's just loving it. He's doing great. He said uh, people were worried that he was sick because he was so thin. He <laughs> was losing so much weight. Yeah, they yeah. thought he had malaria because he was losing so much weight. Right. But no, he's losing weight in a healthy way. Yes. He's losing fat and he's mm -hmm. retaining his muscle. He's getting all the protein. He's getting all the fat soluble vitamins. He's killing it. Yes. So We'll continue to update him, uh, her, his story. I guess I'll do it on my Food Lies social media. We'll do some YouTube videos on it. And yeah, very exciting. Yeah, so exciting. <laughs> All right. Well, find uh, Mary, enableyourhealing.com. Where else can people find you? Uh, uh, Mary Reddick, CNC Instagram, or just Google my name on, or on YouTube. Search for my name. Awesome. Thanks so much, Mary. Uh, these were great episodes and our journeys will continue. Yes. <laughs> many more trips. We have much more to come. <laughs> oh, many more trips, many more uh, collaborations. Yes. We're going to be doing some stuff with Sapien together and technology, hopefully, uh, programs, all yes. kinds of stuff. Yes. This is just the beginning. Just the beginning. <laughs> all right, everyone. We'll, we'll see you again. All right, everyone, thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing with a friend, giving the review on iTunes or the podcast app, going back and starting at episode one, going to nosetail.org to get all our great meats, free shipping options for all boxes. Also go to cows for kids cows and number 4 kidscom and support our cause getting these villages some animals that they really need. Don't let them survive on sugar, flour, and oil, porridge, and chewing on corn stalks. 
please support us on our Indiegogo page. You can click through from cows4kids.com and sapien.org. If you yourself want to make a big dietary change and a health change and get serious, we've got your back. We know that information is out there, but it's hard to implement it. It's hard to know how to customize it to your needs. And that's what we do with our health coach, with our video series, with Dr. Gary and everything else. It's all at sapien.org. Join the program. Still have some of those special prices left. And also the tribe. This is where we hang out. We do Zoom calls with the community. Everyone gets the extended show notes. They get the bonus videos. They get the private website that we all hang out on and talk and ask questions and learn from each other. So that's also at sapien.org. Just click through to the tribe. That's it. We'll see you next week when I'll be in Austin. <laughs>